Thank you all for coming for, to this panel entitled Sacred Music in Context and Practice. Uh, I'm Michael Anderson from the Eastman School of Music at the University of Rochester, and I direct the Scola, which you just heard, singing at Mass. And our group has been very fortunate over the past decade to have the full sponsorship of the Lumen Christi Institute. So it's really helped us to not only do performances, but to produce recordings. And it's wonderful, finally, after years of talking about this, to have, uh, to have a liturgy and see this music in context um, has been a real treat for us. Um, today we're coming together to realize a wish that Thomas Levergood and I have been working on to have now a symposium follow a liturgy with music uh, today on this Feast of Candlemas, the, the Feast of the Presentation. Um, it is one of the ritual turning points of the year. Uh, if you heard about the groundhog this morning, not seeing his shadow in Pennsylvania. Our panel today builds on aspects of the Candlemas Feast and the place of historical music in the church today, expanding profitably, as you'll see, in very different directions. We're delighted to have four distinguished guest speakers uh, to advance these topics. Professors Margot Fassler and Peter Jeffrey have come from the University of Notre Dame. Uh, Professor Robert Kendrick is from the University of Chicago, and our celebrant today, Father uh, Peter Funk, um, will be speaking. I will briefly introduce these speakers this morning and then propose that each give remarks uh, for about 15 minutes or so, and then we'll leave questions at the end uh, for follow-up. So without further ado, Professor Margot Fassler is the Keough Hesburgh Professor of Music History and Liturgy, Professor of Musicology and Ethnomusicology, and Director of the Program of Sacred Music at the University of Notre Dame. She's renowned for her work at the intersection of musicology, liturgical studies, and theology, and is a specialist in sacred music of several periods. Her book, Gothic Song, second edition from Notre Dame Press 2011, won both the John Nicholas Brown Prize of the Medieval Academy of America and the Otto Kinkeldie Prize of the American Musical Logical Society. She's author, co-author, and editor of numerous books and over 60 full-length articles and book chapters. Today, she unveils for us liturgy and culture in female Benedictine communities via medieval chants and processions for Candlemas. Let's welcome Margot Fast. Isn't this great? It's a very unusual um, to be able to uh, address people after they've just witnessed a liturgy and seen the music in action. I'm not really sure that I've been able to do that before. And so um, some of the slides that I prepared were introductory in ways that you really don't need that introduction because you've actually seen the liturgy and, and heard some of the music uh, already this morning. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about the uh, Feast of Candlemas or the presentation, uh, the 2nd of February. Um, I've just written a big article about the procession that we just had a hard time keeping our candles lit uh, for. And um, I've often wondered, you know, about how that worked in the Middle Ages and I got a little bit of a better sense of it today because it's very difficult to keep your candle uh, lighted, as you know. And um, in... Uh, the Middle Ages, those candles were kept lit for a very long time, so we experimented to see what it would be like to keep the candle uh, lighted until the gospel was read, which is what you're supposed to do, and then uh, turn it out at that point, point. and it's really difficult. Um, and the other thing about it is, of course, that the candles were of m much different shapes, as I'll show you in some of the artworks that I, that I have to show you. This is an ancient feast. And it's a feast which comes from the East, as um, all of the major Marian feasts that are celebrated in the Western liturgy do. Um, so it's a feast with a long history. And um, it's one of the three major processions of the, of the church year in the Middle Ages. Um, I've listed them here for you in the basic and most important treatise about those uh, three uh, processions written by Richard of St. Victor. And so um, for every one of these processions, and you can see them listed here, there's, a sac there's, there's something that people get to hold, that people get to process with, and that becomes um, emblematic of the meaning of that uh, particular feast. And um, you know, medieval Christians were pretty good at this. We are not so good at it anymore um, in our practice, I think, and that's something that's been lost. <clears throat> and you can see today, to have those candles as kind of allegorical symbol, um, then you, as you process, take your candle um, into the church, 
the way Joseph and Mary uh, brought Christ into, as is revealed in Luke. And so you, were, wa uh, you walk in the, in, the in, the, uh, in the person of the Virgin Mary. And, um, you know, we ha heard in our sermon about how important it is that the candles go out from the altar, go out as blessed things, and then come back. Mm -hmm. In uh, The Nuns of Barking is uh, a very famous uh, medieval uh, abbey of Benedictine women that I've been studying, which was right on the outskirts of London. And they had tremendously uh, interesting ceremonies for their candles. <clears throat> and one of the <coughs> excuse me, things that happened is that after uh, you, you had the candle and it had gone out, you then um, took the can your candles to the altar and made an offering of the candles because wax is very expensive. Mm -hmm. And so your candle actually became your offering and so not only did you bring the light in, in, in the person of Christ and, and, uh, um, and his parents, but you also then got to make an offering because that's what's happening here. And it's an offering that's, that's filled with ironies and so many of them, I wanna talk just a little bit about the profound exegetical meanings of, uh, of this particular feast. But first I just wanted to show you a few medieval images. Um, you can see there lay people with their candles and you can uh, watch and see how large those candles are. Mm. And of course, <clears throat> that's very different because it would have to burn for so long. Our candles are these little short stubs, you know, and we can burn our hands or drip our wax if we're not careful. Um, in one of the uh, customaries that I've studied, there's a candle snuffing ceremony <laughs> where you snuff your candle in a bucket of water uh, before you can give it to the, uh, up to the altar. So you have to take particular care of the, of the, uh, of the flames because you have, uh, you know, this is quite an amazing ceiling, by the way. I've never seen it before. But uh, you have these wood, wooden roofs, you know, which in, and a lot of fires happen uh, in the Middle Ages. And of course, with so many candles, you can see why that would be the case. Anyway, there are two lay people for the month of February with their candles. Um, I've talked a little bit about uh, the particular characters that you have seen allegorized uh, today in the Mass. And um, you see there, the iconography for this feast is so incredibly popular. I could have given you hundreds and hundreds of wonderful uh, pictures to look at. But one of the most typical things to see is the way that Jesus often reaches out to the priest receiving him. And of course, <clears throat> we've talked about already the ambivalence of the Feast of the Purification. It's right in between that time of the church year um, when you're <clears throat> sort of thinking back to Christmas and the weeks after Christmas, and you're also looking ahead to Lent. And so it's the joy of a child being brought and being seen as the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies, but then you realize that part of that fulfillment is going to uh, require the, ch the child to suffer and to die, and of course then to be resurrected. So there's this ambivalence in the child and how the child uh, himself and his mother um, receive and are, uh, are thinking about this particular feast, and you can see this in the iconography. I have a couple of examples to show you. There again, um, you can see the joy with which uh, Jesus seems to be um, being given over to Simeon. Now, in the next one, um, you see a tremendously exuberant Anna. Um, <laughs> and this is one of my favorites because she's really, uh, she's really embodying the joy of the feast. And it's usually seen, as a, interpreted as a Marian feast in the Middle Ages. And sometimes, even when it falls in that pre-Lent and solemn period, churches with a particular high Mariology, as they, the nuns of Barking would do, would still sing a sequence and still sing an Alleluia and still um, be particularly uh, joyful in this feast, even in a pre-Lenten period. At Barking, the nuns uh, had a, a great deal of land and uh, it was the Feast of the Purification when people who had rented their land could no longer graze their animals on it. So it was also a time in the period of agriculture when there was a shift, uh, various shifts taking place in the, in, the, in the calendar year 
Um, and we hope that we'll have a big shift in our calendar year, um, too, marked by this particular feast. But you can see that it's a time of shift and a time of irony. And here, uh, this is a very touching um, picture, because you can see, I don't know if you panelists can see it or not, it's too bad you can't see it, but it's a very touching um, interpretation of the feast. Because here you see Jesus uh, turning back to his mother, and um, not quite so sure that he, wants, uh, that he wants to be offered as a sacrifice. And the interpretation um, of, uh, of Jesus as the lamb, um, the sacrificial lamb, is something that's very prominent in uh, exegesis on this particular feast. So the most um, extraordinary uh, representation of the meanings of this feast exegetically in the in in the uh, visual arts that I know of is, uh, is one that's at the uh, west portal of Chartres Cathedral, and I loved it so much I wrote a book about it, um, because it's so profound, I think. The west portal itself is a, is a gigantic sermon in stone. Uh, at Chartres uh, in France, uh, the, the, the bishop there uh, had a synod where all the priests came um, every year to be instructed by him for a week or so, and we have some of the sermons from that particular mode of instruction. And I think that this, uh, that this artwork was especially also useful um, for the instruction in the regular uh, exegesis of the various feasts. It's essentially <clears throat> very much about prophecy, and it's about the coming of Christ, and uh, in many different modes. And one of the most important of them is what takes place in the South, so this is the, the south uh, tympanum of the west portal of Chartres Cathedral. It dates from the mid 12th century. And um, you can see what's happening there as, uh, as the purification is on that upper lintel. And uh, is it all right to see it? Can you see it okay? And down below is the nativity of, uh, of Christ being represented. And up above is the Sede Sapientiae, which is uh, Jesus sitting on the lap of his mother as the throne of wisdom in Christ, as the second person of the Trinity representing wisdom. And so uh, you have a double axis, of course, as you do in any work of art. You have, you have works, you have interpretations going this way, and then you have the interpretation of sacrifice and the altar. And you have essentially three different altars being depicted there, and they line right up for you. And, uh, and, and one of them is the sort of the altar of, of, uh, of the nativity. Um, and then above that is the altar with Simeon receiving Jesus. And then above that is the lap of the Virgin Mary. And all three of these, you see, have different meanings, different exegetical senses. But if you look on the lower lentil, lying there, having just given birth, is the Virgin Mary, and her eyes are very deeply bored. And she looks through the whole thing. And it's like a moment of pondering uh, the mysteries of it all in her heart and in her mind. And so it's a very beautiful uh, I think, invitation to all of us to think about these various meanings and, uh, and how they function um, exegetically. So I then also have a, a close-up for you so that you can see it better. And then here, oh, that wasn't the one I wanted. Um, I had a better close-up seems to have disappeared. In any case, we'll have to work with this one. Um, and I think that you can see one of the things that's happening in that lintel is that there is a kind of procession going on. And so um, it's a really good uh, time to recall the different layers, exegetical layers that you have in a mass such as this and in its iconography. You look back to the Old Testament and prophecy and Christ as the fulfillment of that particular prophecy. And if you read sermons from the period, you'll see that there's a lot of uh, exegesis on sacrifice and on some of the sacrifices that happen um, in, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament. And this being a kind of New Testament capstone, fulfillment, statement um, about sacrifice and about the uh, joyful nature of it, with a new light coming into the church, and also with the profundity of, uh, of looking forward to a, a new time. 
And there you see um, the procession lined up on either side. And you see Joseph and Mary. And you see that they're bringing doves with them uh, also to sacrifice. And uh, that symbolism of the two doves is something which is a very lovely um, symbol in so many ways. Uh, I work a lot with the Abbey of Regina Laudes. It's one of the places where I've made a film of a particular community. It's a Benedictine Abbey that's uh, outside of uh, Yale University, about an hour and a half drive. And um, they were giving a talk on the Feast of the Purification one day when I was there. And uh, the priest's vestments had been made by the nuns themselves. And on the front of the vestment, <clears throat> for purification, they had the entire story of the purification. And they had Simeon and Joseph and Mary and candles and all of the things that we've just seen. And then on the back, which only the nuns could see, they had two doves. And the point was that if you really understand uh, the exegesis of this particular feast, you don't really need a lot to trigger your memory and to bring forth this rich understanding that the, feast, that the feast has. So they gave themselves the two doves, and, uh, and they gave the congregation the entire uh, panoply of all of the different meanings. So I think I'll stop there as we go forward and we think about all of the different kinds of exegesis and all the richness that this feast brings to us as we think about its music and we think about the ceremony associated with it. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Professor Bob Kendrick, who teaches music history here at the University of Chicago. a moment of great anxiety as we wait for things to appear on screens. Let me first say that, um, let me first say that this is not working. So let me first welcome those of you who are not from campus, let me welcome uh, both of you, all of you to the university on uh, my behalf and that of my great medievalist colleague, um, Ann Walters Robertson, who is the Dean of the Division of the Humanities. Neither Ann nor I have any kind of appointment in the Divinity School, which is the home of this building. Uh, so it's all the easier for us to do this because we're not paying the bills. And um, it's something that um, we've sort of, uh, but welcome. Uh, for those of you who are students, we're, we're very glad that um, you're able to be here. Um, there we go. Cool. Okay, great. So I simply wanted to take things uh, up forward a little bit in time from Margot's wonderful medieval um, evidence. And I just sort of did a little bit of poking around. Some of this is very, very impressionistic in terms of both some of the music and some of the greater, um, I think, uh, devotional meanings of this feast of the purification or of the presentation uh, on February 2nd. Um, so you got a sense from the readings today that there's on one hand, this is a diffuse gratia, the uh, offertory um, for Mary, uh, talking about Mary's own purity and so on and so forth. And then some of the feast, uh, some of the chants and readings go over the presentation of Christ in the temple and the Simeon story in the Nunc Dimittis, which you heard sung uh, in the wonderful setting by Lasso. Um, that is to say, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation, and so on and so forth. Um, you also heard music from the Renaissance. Uh, besides the Gregorian chant, you heard music by William Byrd, Giovanni Pier Luigi da Palestrina, Pierre de la Rue. Uh, and I guess I should note, uh, just being one of these sort of uh, fatally uh, obsessive people, that today is actually the 425th anniversary of the death of Palestrina, um, who died on this day uh, in 1594 in Rome. Um, but that's just a, a, just a side note. So when I was going over the musical repertory and also the sermon literature uh, for uh, what happens with this feast after um, 
After 1560, after the big movement of reform that sweeps the Catholic Church, not entirely in reaction to Protestantism, um, I noticed one of the things that I thought was really quite interesting, um, and that is a certain tension or at least a certain contrast between the sides of the feast, the readings and the uh, liturgies that has to do with the presentation of Christ as a sacrifice. Uh, Margot made that very, very, very clear. And the Simeon story, that's one side of things. And the purification of Mary uh, on the other. It's one of the few feasts of the church here that has this kind of double uh, title, double meaning and stuff like that. And of course, as I think all of you know, that also reflects wider differences um, between the Western and Eastern churches. In the Western church, this is largely, or some aspect of it is Marian. In the Eastern churches, this is a feast of the Lord. And even if we step outside of Catholicism for a second, um, this continued to be an important feast in magisterial Protestantism, uh, Lutheranism, um, as witnessed by the three or maybe five cantatas that Johann Sebastian Bach wrote for it in a Lutheran liturgy in Leipzig, um, and not least by the 29 cantatas that Georg Philipp Telemann wrote for Lutheran liturgy in Frankfurt and Hamburg in the 18th century. Um, so I want to hold on to that uh, and just look a little bit at the evidence that we have, both sermons and music, um, and uh, then just look a little bit at practice today um, in Italy. So I simply uh, did a certain amount of poking around. Um, in terms of liturgical books and actually what happens to the re medieval readings and so on and so forth, um, largely, although there's a new breviary, that is the readings for the divine office and a new missal, the readings for the mass issued in 1568, 1570, shepherded into, into existence by Cardinal Guglielmo uh, Sirleto at the uh, instigation of Pope Pius V, um, the office and mass uh, text uh, remain largely the same. Uh, before and after. There's a few office antiphons that are changed and, and uh, stuff like that, but basically we're dealing with a kind of medieval legacy, late medieval legacy of text. When looking through, however, the kind of sermons that one hears or that were recited for this feast by various famous Italian preachers after this period, um, I, I simply picked three uh, cases uh, of some of the more famous or widely known um, orders at the time. Uh, the Theatine Bishop Paolo Arezzi, um, who wrote a, a, a homily for the Feast of the Purification, um, the Neapolitan Discalce Carmelite, Emanuele di Gesù Maria, uh, whose career took him from Naples to Vienna and back, um, and the non-clerical rhetorician and erstwhile music theoretician, the South Netherlands uh, intellectual Ericios Puteanos, um, uh, who worked also in Italy for a while. Um, and one of the things that one really gets from these three sermons, which are all rubricated, they're all destined for the purification, is how they concentrate on Mary and her purity with the idea of the paradox of a pure woman submitting herself to the old law to be purified. Um, and with analogies to Christ's presentation uh, in, in the old law and or his baptism. Um, in several of these, there are also very strong tones of um, uh, immaculatism, that is to say, emphasis on the immaculate conception, uh, which um, would have had a particular resonance at the highly immaculatist court of, um, for instance, the Spanish Netherlands, uh, where Puteanos was um, actually uh, working. Uh, and I just wanted to, if the uh, internet will allow me, to show you um, just one moment of the uh, sermon the, by the Carmelite. So this one says, uh, uh, humility exalted, uh, sermon number one for the Feast of the Purification um, of uh, uh, Virgin Mary. Whoops, I am not, this is not doing what it's supposed to be doing, which is not a good sign. Let's see what happens if we switch things. Well, I might have to live without PowerPoint, at least for now, uh, in the, um, or without internet, at least for now, in the, um, in the inter interim of things. Um, okay, fine, no problem. Let me just get, bring us back to PowerPoint here. Um, and now I don't have anything at all, which is really not a good sign. Okay, this will be in a second. Um, so Puteanus' sermon, which is some 60 pages um, in its um, length, um, really concentrates on the idea of, the, of a pure woman who is, um, let me now try to bring PowerPoint back here and see if we can get this 
doing its thing. Otherwise, I'm going to need a little bit of PowerPoint uh, help um, and internet help if you can get it because I ran everything uh, okay before. Otherwise, we can just power down and power up. Okay, so while we're waiting, I'm simply going to give you the uh, verbal content of the next slide. So we heard a couple of different pieces, different texts today in, um, uh, in polyphonic settings. Um, and as I look through the repertory of printed music for this feast, um, certainly one of the uh, most favorite ones was something you didn't hear. It's an antiphon for the Magnificat in Second Vespers uh, called uh, Horie Beata Virgo, which talks both about Mary and both about, um, uh, both about Simeon. Um, there was a setting by Palestrina, first published in 1563. That book of motets that he did in that year had actually 12 different reprints. Um, which makes one think that at one point or another there were something like 6,000 copies of this book circulating around Europe between 1563 and 1620, um, and settings by other composers. Some of the other texts that you heard today also were in um, uh, were set to, to polyphony. You heard Responsum Acipit uh, by Palestrina. That's a piece that's preserved only in the um, uh, in Sistine Chapel manuscripts. You're welcome to sort of play with this and sort of go uh, from there. Um, and the other big piece, which is the other big text which is associated with this, is the Antiphon Adornatalum, uh, which um, Mike has performed on other occasions and um, uh, is something that's very, very important. Uh, adorn your bridal chamber, O Zion, prepare to receive the Lord. There, go. there we go, thanks. Um, and so um, Adorna Talamum is kind of interesting uh, because of the fact that um, one of the ways that it's used is as the, accompanying the procession. Um, and it, Adorna is kind of interesting. I'll just sort of bring you down here. Um, there are large scale settings for cathedrals. Uh, but in terms of our little procession today, um, I think it's interesting that the Catholic recusant composer, that is to say, non-conforming composer in England, William Byrd, uh, took the trouble to include a short setting of this text in his Gradualia, which is a collection of music for the propers of the Mass in the Catholic liturgy throughout the year. Um, and that must have sort of foreseen some kind of procession under the um, circumstances of um, what was uh, what liturgy was in Elizabethan England, Catholic liturgy was, um, and that is essentially um, short, small, semi-licit, sort of semi-underground processions. But it was important enough that, that Bird included a setting. Um, the liturgical use of these is uh, of these kinds of motets and antiphons and so on and so forth is. is um, somewhat varied, tends to be more characteristic of Rome and cathedrals. It's very limited in Spain and New Spain, Latin America. Um, and one could get into that more, but time does not sort of permit. And so we're uh, I'm going to simply go sort of go on. And the other thing that I sort of uh, wanted to look at was also the repertory of the dr mu sacred music drama known as the Oratorio. You can think of Handel's Messiah, which is an English language version of this, although not done for Catholic liturgy. And there's a lot of these in 17th century Italy. Um, there are relatively few for our feast. Um, there are six of them which are titled Purification of Maria Vergine. I abbreviated that to MV. Um, and two of them that are titled Presentazione di Gesù Cristo, or Presentation of the Lord. Um, and I want to just note that in case the terminology is not already confusing enough, there's also the feast on November 21st of the Presentation of Mary, Presentazione di Maria Vergine, and that feast on February, on November 21st should not be confused uh, with their day. Um, okay, I was going to give you musical examples, uh, but I think what I'm going to do is simply give you uh, just a little bit of the text here, just in the interest of time. Uh, this gives you the opening of the Palestrina Motet, which was arguably the one piece that was most heard in Renaissance Catholic Europe. Um, and again, this is a piece which th this text, Horie Beata Vir Maria Virgo et Simeon Repletos Spiritui Sancti, brings together the two aspects of the feast. 
On the other hand, an oratorio for the Feast of the Purification done in Rome in 1640, or actually better, not done in Rome in 1640, uh, by the amateur musician and uh, world traveler Pietro della Valle, uh, is actually kind of a replication of the Nunc Dimittis. And it starts off with the recitative for Simeon called uh, La Chapeau, La Chau, My Signor, uh, Lord, at last uh, let your servant close his eyes in peace, and so on and so forth. And it, t it takes us through the entire scene with, with Simeon. Um, now, I want to just for close very, very briefly with a little bit of current popular practice. Um, and here I want to focus on uh, sort of two sites in contemporary Italy, and we'll see if the techno, actually maybe it's better just given time if, I'll, I'll, if I can do the, the YouTubes afterwards in the discussion or afterwards. Um, so one place that I think is very, very interesting is a small town in Piedmont. So this is about 60 miles northeast of Turin in northwest um, Italy. This is a place where a small town which lives in a valley. And so it only gets 17% of the natural light that it should be um, expected to get in the course of a year. So like a couple of other places in Europe, the town has set up a gigantic reflecting mirror on the mountains of the valley, which reflects light into the town. Uh, most of the year. There's a procession in this town on February 2nd. For this, the light is actually turned off. The mirror is actually turned off. So it's done in with the effect of the candles being in um, semi-darkness. Um, and that, I think, is very interesting. It's not, from what I can tell from my internet ethnography, a whole lot of um, uh, musically distinguished, but it's, uh, there's a number of other interesting things. Maybe more musically interested is a procession which happens on February 2nd at Monte Vergine, which is a territorial Benedictine abbey near Naples. It's actually near Avellino. Uh, and it's been a Marian sanctuary since it was founded by St. William of Vercelli in the 12th century. Uh, there's a procession on February 2nd. You have to go up a cable car, which you can see if we get around to the YouTube, um, to a Byzantine-style icon of the Madonna, the Mama Schiavona. Schiavona means Slavic, um, with large popular contingents coming from the nearby city of Avellino and a little bit further from Naples. Um, and one of the things that I think is also very interesting is that because, according to legend, in 1256, the image of the Madonna managed to release a couple of uh, gay male lovers who had been bound outside of town and left to die of exposure, uh, and she, by her intervention they were released and able to continue um, living, um, this procession has become a uh, very favorite occasion for uh, lesbian, gay, uh, and uh, bi, and, and uh, transgender Catholics, uh, both from Naples and really across Italy. Musically, the Montevergine procession is characterized by improvised song and uh, the beating of the carnival frame drum, which we can also see on the YouTube when we get to it, it's called the Tamura. Um, and there are improvised songs to the Madonna, both in the procession coming from the abbey to the side altar of the Madonna, uh, and then in front of the Byzantine icon. Um, and here I think there's a real kind of Marian focus with a certain amount of urban street religion, uh, as we would call, as one would call it, uh, imagining this sort of uh, practices of Naples um, and, and other large cities. Uh, but here it's happening at a mountain sanctuary. So I think I'm going to end now. I think that the takeaway point from that um, is the fact that the richness, the diversity, whatever you want to call it, the contrast of the feast, allows and allowed in past uh, for a lot of community uh, stamping, a, a lot of sort of community identification with one aspect of the feast or another. Um, and that, I think, is something that I think just really attribute to the uh, incredible kinds of riches, not only of this particular day, uh, but present in liturgy, past and present as a whole. So, there. So Professor Peter Jeffrey is the Michael P. Grace the Second Chair of Medieval Studies and Associate Director of Academics of Sacred Music at the University of Notre Dame. He holds a PhD in music history from Princeton where he returned to teach in 1993 and has been the Scheide Professor of Music History Emeritus since 2009. He has published over 100 articles and books on music history, ethnomusicology, and other topics including the title, Translating Tradition, a chant historian uh, reads Liturgiam Authenticum, Liturgical Press, 2005. Jeffrey was the first musicologist to receive a Genius Award Fellowship from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, and we would be remiss not to mention that he is an oblate of St. Benedict of St. John's Abbey, Collegeville, Minnesota. 
uh, in his capacity in the sacred music degree program at Notre Dame, we've asked him to uh, use this moment to kind of pivot from the historical evidence to uh, church practice today. And in his role in the sacred degree uh, program, we've asked him to talk about the goals of the program and where it's come in the last decade. It's, it's celebrating its 10th an anniversary. Um, so specifically, how does the sacred music degree program at Notre Dame prepare students for lives in ministry in light of our history of church music? Professor Jeffrey. So uh, first, I ask you to just sort of bracket out everything that's happened in the last 50 years. Uh, I'll just go back and read what Vatican II actually said, and the result will be what I call Vatican II done right. Uh, there's actually two documents. One is the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy from 1963, and then there's another one, uh, the Instruction on Sacred Music, which was about how to apply the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy. That's from 1967. Uh, so I know many of these texts are familiar to you, um, but first of all, the... Uh, the, the musical tradition of the universal church is a treasure of inestimable value. Um, but I particularly wanted to point out um, the, is there a pointer on this? No, okay. Well, um, ministerial function, munus ministeriale. Uh, the fathers of the church and the Roman pontiffs have explained more precisely the ministerial function supplied by sacred music in the service of the Lord. Uh, therefore, uh, sacred music is more holy in proportion as it's more closely connected with the liturgical action. Uh, this is what's included in the ministerial function. It adds delight to prayer, fosters unity of minds, confers greater solemnity upon the sacred rites. Uh, then there's also a purpose of sacred music, a finis, finis, an, an end in, uh, this is Latin, following Greek, where the word end can also mean completion, goal, things like that. So uh, the purpose of sacred music, which is the glory of God, sanctification of the faithful, liturgical worship is given a more noble form when the divine offices are celebrated solemnly with the assistance of the sacred ministers and the active participation of the people. Uh, more on this. The, uh, the first, here we go. Um, this is once again the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, what I just referred to. Musicam Sacram expanded that part, what I think is important. They start by quoting again, given a more normal form when celebrated in song. But then they add, indeed, through this form, prayer, prayer is expressed in a more attractive way. The mystery of the liturgy with its hierarchical and community nature is more openly shown. The unity of hearts is more profoundly achieved by the union of voices. Minds are more easily raised to heavenly things by the beauty of the sacred rites. And the whole celebration more clearly prefigures that heavenly liturgy, which is enacted in the holy city of Jerusalem. Pastors of souls will therefore do all they can to achieve this form of celebration. So what do we get out of this? Sacred music has many functions and purposes. Uh, it's not just about giving the people something to sing. It's not just about in injecting a little emotion uh, into what might otherwise be, you know. Uh, <laughs> sacred music does a lot of things. It's a deep, complex, uh, varied medium with many goals and purposes. They're interrelated, of course. Uh, but there's just a lot more to what music is and can do than 
many parish celebrations seem uh, to recognize. Uh, now, as for the treasury of sacred music to be preserved and fostered with great care, choirs must be diligently promoted. Um, bishop, bishops and pastors must be at pains to ensure that whenever the sacred action is celebrated, the whole body of the faithful may be able to contribute that active participation that is rightly theirs. In the Latin church, the pipe organ is to be held in high esteem, for it is the traditional musical instrument which adds a wonderful splendor to the church's ceremonies. Uh, the church acknowledges Gregorian chant as especially suited to the Roman liturgy, therefore other things being equal, it should be given, this is always translated pride of place, uh, but I think the first place or the chief place would be a better translation, uh, closer to the Latin. Um, Musicam Sacram adds to that in the second quote here. Above, <coughs> above all, the study and practice of Gregorian chant is to be promoted because with its special characteristics it is a basis of great importance for the development of sacred music. After all, a great deal of the treasury of sacred music was created against the background of Gregorian chant, where Gregorian chant was the basic layer, but much of the rest of the music, even if it doesn't actually quote the chant, it's inspired by it, it relates to it in some way, it assumes that there will be chant elsewhere in the service and so on. Much of Western music history grows out of Gregorian chant. Um, okay, uh, particular law remaining in force, the use of the Latin language is to be preserved. Did you know that? <laughs> uh, including steps should be taken so that the faithful may be able to say or sing together in Latin those parts of the ordinary which pertain to them. So, what do we get from that? The treasury should be preserved even though it is in Latin. And a phrase that suggested itself to me, a hermeneutic of continuity. You ever heard that one? That comes from Pope Benedict XVI, of course. Vatican II didn't say that, but it's... Certainly the documents need to be read in the context of what was happening at the time and in a way that's, uh, you know, when they say something should continue, something should be preserved, that's what they meant. So training. The documents actually say a lot about teaching and training. Great importance is to be attached to the teaching and practice of music in seminaries, novitiates, houses of study, uh, of religious, of both sexes, and also in other Catholic institutions and schools. Teachers are to be carefully trained. It is desirable to found higher institutes of sacred music, wherever this can be done. How, how often does that happen? Composers and singers, especially boys. Now, I don't know if pueri must mean boys, but that's how it's usually translated. Uh, must also be given genuine liturgical training. Musicam Sacram added, the choir can consist, according to the customs of the country and other circumstances, men and boys, or men and boys only, or men and women, or even when there is a genuine case for it, of uh, women only. Case. All right, this is the first official statement that women can sing in choirs, even though women have been singing or going in chant for its entire period of existence, and lots of choirs had women in them before Vatican II. I was there, I remember that. Uh, but anyway, the first official document that you can have women in choirs is Musicam Sacram. Uh, all right, composers should feel their vocation is to cultivate sacred music. Let them produce compositions which have qualities proper to genuine sacred music. Religious singing by the people is to be intelligently fostered. Uh, now, I, it's solaire terre. I, went, I looked that up in the dictionary. It says, skillfully, dexterously, shrewdly, sagaciously, ingeniously fostered. The lay people should be taught to perform the church's music, you know, not just 
whatever, let's just do what you feel. So, uh, so that the voices of the faithful may ring out according to the norms and requirements of the rubrics. It is desirable to set up a liturgical commission to be assisted by experts in liturgical science, sacred music, art, and pastoral practice. Most dioceses, I think, have liturgical commissions, but they also envisioned commissions just for music. Besides the sacred liturgy, there should be a commission for sacred music and for sacred art. So what do we get out of this? Training is required for everybody, seminarians, religious, students, teachers, composers, singers, choirs, and the people. Then there's this issue, the most complex issue of the 21st century, I think. Legitimate variations and adaptations for different groups, regions, peoples, especially in mission lands, provide the substantial unity of the Roman rite is preserved. Within limits set by the books, um, the uh, competent authority will approve adaptations, including in sacred music, as well as language, processions, etc. Okay. In certain parts of the world, especially in mission lands, there are peoples who have their own musical traditions, play a great part in their musical life. Due importance should be attached to their music and a suitable place given to it. Uh, other instruments besides the organ may also be admitted for use. Therefore, when missionaries are being given training in music, every effort should be made to see that they become competent in promoting the traditional music of these peoples. So even where we're talking about introducing something that's not the treasury of sacred music because it's the people's culture, people are supposed to be trained. The people who guide this are supposed to know what they're doing. Uh, so yeah, even missionaries <coughs> excuse me, should be fully trained in the music of the cultures they work in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> There's a culture you don't hear a lot about. All right, so just summing up the conclusions again. Sacred music has many functions and purposes. The treasury should be preserved even in Latin. Everyone should be well trained. Institutes should be founded for this purpose. Even missionaries who work in historically non-Christian cultures should be fully trained for legitimate adaptations of the local music. So, um, I believe our program is the one that comes closest to doing what the council actually said. We have, uh, first of all, a two-year Master of Sacred Music. It has more academic courses than most Master of Sacred Music programs, I think. Uh, first of all, there's, uh, there's a 12 hours of four courses, history, theory, and analysis of classical music we do have a lot of courses, but regularly taught are Gregorian chant, uh, counterpoint, period courses on Renaissance music, Baroque music, uh, classical music, etc. cetera. Um, and the other four courses come from liturgy and ritual studies. Uh, there we have, um, includes courses in Eucharist, courses in prayer, hymnology, uh, worship and music in the USA are among, among the courses that are regularly taught. And every student takes either ritual studies or world music cultures. Um, and thus uh, they, they are exposed to the ethnographic study of ritual and music. That is to say how the study of what people actually do in real time, which is not to say that anything people do is okay but at least understanding how people deal with ritual issues, how people deal with music. Uh, and this, this makes them much better to make judgments about pastoral situations that they'll actually be in because they understand uh, some of the processes and so on. Then there's an equal number of credit hours for practical music, repertory performance, and organ voice or choral conducting. Those are the three areas where you can get an MSN. So they have private lessons, they have everything. They have uh, repertory classes. We have choirs, lots and lots of choirs. Uh, and especially we have 
a, uh, well, I'll, I'll go on. Everybody has an internship. Everybody works in a church somewhere. Uh, some, a lot of the organists work in the basilica on campus, but uh, some people work in churches in town. Um, most of the, uh, many of the students work with the Notre Dame Children's Choir, which is one of our big success stories. We, we thought we'd be, we thought it'd be great if we could get 20 kids, and we're now, we've now got hundreds of kids, people battling down the door. We've d divided the choir by age group. We even have a choir for special ed kids. Uh, so it's just a, a huge success. And, uh, and provides- 340 kids. How many? 340. 340. Okay, every time I talk about this, the number's bigger. <laughs> right, but anyway, so it also, it's not just good for the kids, but it provides internships for our students, that they learn to work with children, and then go out in the world, they know how to do children's choirs. And another thing we totally didn't expect was children started asking for organ lessons. So all of a sudden, our organ students are giving lessons to, to these kids. It was 25. the kids, that, 25 kids. <laughs> it was their idea. We didn't think of it as a way to promote interest in the organ, but there you have it. And we also, more recently, started a doctor of musical arts um, in organ or choral conducting. Two minutes. Okay. Uh, they, of course, get more specialized training in whatever their medium is. They have secondary areas, like keyboard voice conducting as a secondary area. They do take academic courses, uh, and they have another track of more specialized courses that follow their interests. So I've done independent studies and things like Slavic chant notation and things like that. Uh, all right, then uh, in the third year they write a thesis and they give a lecture recital. So uh, there are people who can express themselves who can do research as well as performance. And uh, I think that's basically it. Uh, can you read our, our, our website is very easy to remember. It's just sacredmusic.nd.edu, very simple. There's our new building in the low corner. We're, we've been in there for one year. It's a huge advance over what we had, which was basically nothing. Uh, we've got a new organ in the Basilica. It's one of many great organs that we have. Uh, and you see some of our singers and choirs and so on. And I think that's, I think that's my last slide. <laughs> Thank you. Our final speaker, Father Peter Funk, and our second Benedictine today, is the prior of the Monastery of the Holy Cross and a contemplative Benedictine monastery in the South Side neighborhood of Bridgeport in Chicago. Father Peter received his BA in music from the University of Chicago, and after graduating, he was a choral conductor at St. Thomas the Apostle Parish and at the University of Chicago. He entered monastic life in 1997, received a master's degree in theology at St. John's School of Theology, uh, Collegeville, uh, Minnesota, where he majored in scripture. In 2012, he helped to found the, the choir Scola Laudis, uh, whose mission is to reintroduce the Catholic tradition of polyphony at the monastery's celebration of Vespers. Father Peter's composed numerous motets and four a cappella settings of the Mass, and today we ask him to sort of tie things together for us in many ways, reflecting on the role of sacred music in modern practice from his perch at the monastery and his experience of the sacred through music in his ministry. Father Peter. Thank you, it's always good to be back here. Uh, and it's an honor to share this stage with such distinguished scholars. I should mention that our monastery benefits quite a, a lot from the study of musicology uh, because uh, there have been so many interruptions in the tradition of sacred music and, and certainly in monasticism as well uh, that uh, it's easy to have a kind of short-sighted understanding of the tradition as what happened uh, you know, in the last generation or something and forget uh, the great complexity of the whole of the tradition. We've 
I think we've seen a lot of that already today. So yes, I saw in the, the title of this uh, event today that we were going to hear uh, reflections on corporations of plain chant polyph polyphonic tradition in contexts such as a contemporary monastic community, and I guess that's me. Um, I also would like to reflect, though, with you on why this incorporation has proven so difficult. Uh, and uh, so let me begin by saying that uh, my brothers and I are really practitioners of sacred music, or what I might prefer to call liturgical music. Uh, so we sing around three hours a day. When I entered the monastery, some of my friends said, uh, oh gosh, are they going to let you do music? <laughs> and uh, as it happens, yes. Uh, so most of what we do is in the style of Gregorian chant, though we do a lot of it in English. And my first 14 years in the monastery, I worked on uh, this English setting, which is based on the current Antiphonale Monasticum, the monastic antiphons. Once a month, uh, we celebrate solemn vespers with Scola Laudis, as you just heard. And in fact, this evening, we're going to round off today's feast uh, with Latin chant, and then settings of the Magnificat by Lasso, Ave, Ma Ave Maria Stella by Palestrina, and Motets by Bird. And then on Sundays, we sing a polyphonic mass setting, which is, in, in principle, simple enough for the congregation to join in, but we found that you have to train them. You know, it's actually important to teach, say, our oblates how to sing the Mass. So before I entered the monastery, for some years I've made a living as a performing musician in a variety of contexts, and much of my personal reflection on sacred music concerns the continuity and discontinuity of contemporary mus musical idioms, there are many of them, and then the requirements uh, of the demanding liturgy. So when I was the conductor of the university chorus here at the U of C, we typically had around 25 hours of rehearsal for a one hour concert at the end of the quarter. And, um, and we might not ever repeat any of that music again, and certainly in the lifetime of a typical undergraduate, we probably would never sing the same pieces. Uh, in the monastery, it's quite the reverse. We actually uh, are lucky if we could fit in an hour of rehearsal a week and uh, we perform over 20 hours. And this uh, has certain requirements then for liturgical music. You can't, you can't do the same kind of music. So for example, uh, and I would just point out that the music that the church documents hold up as typical of the liturgy tends to be Gregorian chant and Renaissance polyphony, and they have these characteristics. Uh, when one sings Gregorian chant every day, you learn that it has formulas. Uh, you, you learn to sight read it after a while. Sometimes when people encounter chant for the first time, they think it's boring for this reason, because, well, gosh, this one has the same ending. Dee -dee -da, da, 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 da. Oh, how many times can you do that? Well, actually, as one of my uh, confreres has said, uh, boy, it's such a relief when we get that domine at the end of the piece, because we know we can relax now, you know, we can move on to the next thing. So it's a different mindset that you get into when you have to sing lots of repertoire this way. And uh, so you learn that uh, typical scale degrees match word accents. Uh, there are typical cadential figures at the end of phrases that round off grammatical sections of the text that uh, elaborate certain meanings within the text and so on. It's a very subtle art form actually. Uh, but it's hard to catch the subtleties unless you do a lot of it. Uh, and you can make comparisons even over the course of the whole liturgical year, uh, how chants show up in different places, for example. Um, certain approaches within Renaissance polyphony have a similar quality. Uh, so when I was younger, I found Palestrina's music kind of pale, frankly, in comparison with Josquin, who was my hero. Uh, but I've come to appreciate the fact that, say, a typical cathedral choir could actually sing one of Palestrina's Magnificat settings, a different one every day, without too much trouble because uh, his music tends to, again, to make use of similar formulae. Uh, and I would personally say that uh, he really perfected this and it's one of the reasons why he's one of the great uh, standard bearers of the Western musical tradition. But I think uh, the closely related uh, late 16th century Spanish school has a lot of the same characteristics. I'm thinking of Victoria and Guerrero in this way. Um, well, I often find when we do lasso, the, the choir gets, thinks it's easy and they get lost. Uh, but uh, hopefully that won't happen tonight at the Magnificat. So 
The liturgy, by rights, uh, because of our baptism, should be our everyday life. There's this place where St. Paul says, you know, it, uh, I, I wish I could go away and be with Christ, but for your sake, I'm still here. And that actually, I think, applies to all of us. When we're baptized, we die to this world, and, uh, but, but our Lord allows us to stay here because there's still work to be done. But our homeland is the heavenly kingdom, and it has uh, its own public work, which is what liturgy is. Uh, it has its own rituals that emphasize our citizenship there. Uh, help bring us together to know our, uh, how we relate to one another and so on. Uh, so this, what this means, though, is that within the church, there really is need of the contemplative life. There have to be people who are set aside uh, to live this to the fullest possible extent. And then uh, be, there, there used to be this uh, image in the medieval church of the, you know, this chain where you have the angels holding on to the monks, holding on to the friars, holding on to the priests and so on. And everybody's uh, a link in the chain bringing us home to the Father. It frequently happens at our monastery that guests go away from solemn vespers with mass and say, wow, I felt like I was just in heaven. And uh, that's good. That's what the liturgy should awaken in us. We should have a sense of going home to our heavenly homeland. But I think for that to happen, in my experience, uh, it's, it is, again, helpful that there are some persons in the church who really arrange their lives around the liturgy and around sacred music. I'm very encouraged to hear about this program at Notre Dame. I, I think we need those sorts of things outside the monastery as well, a really concentrated immersion in the tradition. Uh, because it's, it's immense and it takes time to change the way we hear music, to change the way we perceive the liturgy, et cetera. Um, and what, what's happened, uh, I think it's fair to say that the practice of sacred music in the contemporary Catholic Church has become incoherent. Um, and I, I would like to say that this is, there are many reasons for this, and I'm gonna touch on them next uh, by way of offering some ideas for a solution. One thing is that uh, liturgy has often been reduced to an expression of sort of religion, uh, which is an adjunct to real life. So there's life and then, then we have our religious things that we do over here. Uh, and as I said, this reverses the priority that the liturgy is actually our real life and then we're sent into the world to do the work that God has allowed us here to remain to do. Um, and, and then participation feels like personal choice. Well, I'll go to this if I feel like it. And monks, we don't have that choice, you know, and, and nor will we want to exercise that choice at such time when we get to heaven, right? We don't want to say like, well, I'll join in the heavenly liturgy, oh, but I've got something else to do. No, that won't be the case at that time. So this brings me to a second reflection that immersion in the liturgy tends over time, uh, as I suggested in my homily today too, to bring about a change of awareness one becomes more attuned to the fact that the liturgy, even while we're talking here, it's still going on. So the angels and saints continue to sing the liturgy all the time. And when we say, oh God, come to my assistance, oh Lord, make haste to help me, we enter into something that's ongoing already. Okay, so when we enter into the liturgy for the presentation or purification, uh, this is already in some mystical way going on in heaven, and we are inserting ourselves into that reality. Uh, this requires a stance of asceticism and discipleship. So uh, it's what Father Michael Casey calls an antecedent willingness. Uh, so this means I have to let go of certain personal goals or personal expectations for the liturgy and uh, allow myself to be formed by something coming from outside me. Uh, this by no means precludes creativity, uh, as I hope that you'll understand. But I'd like to uh, finish here uh, my comments today by talking about how the tradition of liturgical music came to be incoherent. And what I mean by that word, uh, I'm, I'm going to be borrowing from the philosophy of Alasdair MacIntyre. So if you are familiar with his uh, understanding of traditions, it will help. Hopefully if you're not, uh, I won't lose you too much. So what I mean by this is that I find that when church musicians get together to talk about the problems we face, um, we actually struggle to discuss these things rationally because we all have our own ideas of what the problem is and how to fix it, but we don't know how to disagree or how to work toward a shared solution in some way. Uh, we tend to fragment into rival camps. Uh, if we do manage agreement, 
uh, it can be done by authority, so an authoritative source. We can have the, the uh, council documents, for example, and we need those. I'm not uh, denigrating those in any way. But they're there uh, as authorities because we want to enter into the same mindset that, uh, of authorship, of, of uh, participation that the church fathers have. Uh, so uh, the, another way that we uh, manage to solve our disagreements is by the economic monopoly of music publishers, uh, which is an even worse solution, obviously. So according to McIntyre, tradition is an ongoing argument about the common good. So we first of all have to see ourselves as having a common good and wanting that, and then and having a certain responsibility to stick it out together and not bail when uh, someone has an opinion that, that we find problematic or uh, challenges me to give a better reason for why I uh, think Shostakovich is better than Palestrina. So arguments presuppose rationality, obviously, and so the problem with settling disputes by too much recourse to authority without being able to argue about what, say, the authority means by certain phrases or whatever, um, is that uh, it, we, we lose the ability to work at the local level and really connect and build up a tradition. And uh, instead, it continues to fragment. And we can just kind of come together in local groups for a short time and then go our separate ways, very postmodern kind of idea. Uh, I would say the tradition was actually already becoming incoherent in Palestrina's day. And uh, so, for instance, one of the things that happened after the Council of Trent was actually the, the, the near destruction of our chant inheritance because the chants were uh, shortened, a lot of notes were kicked to the curb, and it wasn't until the late 19th century that the Salem monks were able to prove that the longer chants were actually more original. Uh, there was a centralization of liturgical authority, and that meant the suppression or waning of a lot of liturgical variety and different rites and so on. Uh, uh, an, an example of this would be the reduction of the nor number of sequences. So the sequence was a kind of hymn, a strophic kind of chant that was done uh, before the gospel. And uh, these were extremely popular in the High Middle Ages, but after the Council of Trent, they were reduced to four. And I think probably most of us are lucky if we hear more than the Easter sequence during the course of the year now. Uh, and the problem with this, it's not that maybe some excesses couldn't have been pruned away, but it was a living link. It was a, a, a very interesting organic development of chant that was going on throughout the Middle Ages, and then it was suddenly stopped, and uh, this huge gulf uh, opened up between contemporary practice and what was going on right before it. And uh, instead, we looked back to sort of old music that we weren't necessarily connected to in the same way. Okay, so that probably sounds familiar because I think we ran into the same problem after Vatican II. Um, last of all, in terms of this rupture, I've talked about the importance of the monastic life for the church's liturgical tradition and musical tradition. Uh, and we've heard about how Gregorian chant really is at the foundational level of, of Catholic music. And so there, again, need to be places where chant is just done and it becomes a, a living part of, of who we are. Uh, beginning with the plague in the 14th century, uh, there was wanton destruction and suppression of monasteries. Uh, so the plague was the first one. Monasteries were especially prone to this because we, we tend to stick close together in cloisters. And so when one person gets sick, everybody gets sick. But then this was followed by the Reformation, uh, by Enlightenment monarchs, uh, with a special shout out to Napoleon. Uh, various anti-clerical movements in the 20th century. This resulted in one case of an entire community of monks from our congregation being executed by Spanish communists. And so this prolonged wasting of monasticism means an inevitable loss of certain forms of chant that can only be cultivated uh, in the slow tempo of a monastic life. So for instance, the responsoria prolixa. There are, these, there are hundreds, I think, probably the musicologists can tell me better than, than I can say, maybe even thousands of these responsories from the Middle Ages. These were after you would listen to the reading from the scriptures at vigils and early, early in the morning or late, late at night, there'd be this long chant that could, it could take five minutes, could take 12 minutes to sing these sometimes. Uh, we do some of them in our monastery. Uh, some brothers really quail when they show up in the books because they're hard. But um, these are almost never done again. And say in the Roman breviary, we just get you know, sort of a recited text of a few lines uh, in place. 
So the recovery of the tradition by the monks of Salem was an amazing feat of, uh, among other things, scholarship and political savvy. But I would say one of the things that would help us to, to move that along is to note that a kind of romanticism clings to it. And uh, why would I consider this unhelpful? Uh, I would call romanticism a form of irrationalism based in part on a lionization of emotion and of the past. Uh, so chant understood romantically does have a certain amount in common with a healthy affectivity in prayer and with this respect for tradition. Uh, but uh, I'm just going to tell you what I think would help to purify this romantic impulse, and that is uh, renunciation of, this is a big topic, so I hope you don't mind me ending here and just making a suggestion, mm -hmm. renunciation of, of the philosophy of nominalism. So uh, what I can tell you about this is in opposition to nominalism where sort of individuals get to name things and there's no sort of nature behind the objects in the world, the Desert Fathers uh, had something called natural contemplation. This means seeing the whole world as a sacrament of God's love. And so reading with the light of Christ the nature of created things. So for example, music itself has a nature. The liturgy has a nature. Uh, other events that make use of music, such as weddings, holidays, sporting events, military engagements, each of these have their own inner meaning. And somehow or other, because God has uh, will them into being, they, they communicate something about him and his intentions for us. So the proper understanding of music requires us to see it embedded in a rational world that God has made rational through his logos. Uh, it requires us to ponder the nature of the human voice, uh, the differences between men's voices and women's voices, children's voices, adults' voices. The nature of music is in harmony with the nature of wood, brass, string, breathing, uh, walking, beating hearts, sound waves, etc. cetera. Uh, one reason the organ is, has pride of place uh, is, uh, and not the piano, I discovered this because I used to play piano at Calvert House back in the day, the piano is a percussion instrument. It doesn't accompany voice as well. Uh, the organ and being a reed instrument and brass instrument is able to sustain notes in the same way the human voice can. And so the guitar similarly doesn't work for accompanying liturgical music. So a confident tradition does look to the past, but it's a way of yearning for the future. And this is one way of distinguishing between a fleeting optimism that's based in worldly progress and a lasting hope based in the promises of a more and more realized eschatology. Thank you. Well, um, let's see. The, the story as we find it in Luke actually combines two ancient uh, Old Testament rituals. And one is the, uh, the purification of the woman after childbirth. Uh, but the other is the redemption of the firstborn, uh, which is to say uh, in... Um, Old Testament times, the Hebrews were surrounded by people who actually believed that the first child, or the, uh, whether human or a farm animal, the first child should be, should be sacrificed and offered to, to God. And the story about Abraham sacrificing Isaac uh, was, you know, was created in that context. Uh, and what the, the ancient Israelites did not do that, but they did have a ceremony uh, called the redemption of the firstborn, where the father, the father buys back the firstborn so that he doesn't have to sacrifice him. And that is described in the Old Testament. Uh, so even, in, even at the level of the gospel, you can, you can, both of them are in there. Uh, and uh, uh, so you, you can look at it either way. The, uh, in the uh, earliest... Uh, Sources, uh, the, the earliest source we have is the diary, the diary of Egeria, who was a, a Latin-speaking nun who visited Jerusalem in the late fourth century. Uh, it's, it's called the, the Meeting of the Lord, as because as the, the Lord meets Simeon. Um, but um, 
over time, in different times and places, the emphasis was different. So in, in the Middle Ages, it was often seen as a feast of the Virgin, and so the emphasis was on the purification of the Virgin. Uh, and so uh, a lot of the chants are about that. Uh, but in, in uh, more modern times, in the, uh, like following the liturgical renewal, they wanted to put the emphasis back on Jesus, and so they made it they, they call it the, uh, the presentation of, of the Lord. But they're both implicit in, in the, uh, oh, going all the way back to the story as told by Luke, they're both implicit. Um, well, I think one of the things we find in uh, the Renaissance and after is, uh, you know, what, what I would consider, I, I should say, I don't consider secular music bad or something like that. And in fact, the, say, the, the classical music tradition, I think, is a, a, a wonderful expansion of, of the Western musical tradition. Uh, you know, many of the great values that were cultivated in churches uh, going out and, and becoming uh, a kind of, uh, uh, showing their fecundity in a new uh, uh, set of social circumstances, let's say. Um, I would say, you know, we really do move away, we start moving away, I should say, because I, I think with someone like Bach's cantatas, we, we're still working with really liturgical music. Um, but we're, we're moving more toward uh, music that's at a, a slight distance from the liturgy in various ways. So even something like Monteverdi's famous Vespers, uh, it's hardly performable uh, in, in a liturgy. Bach's B minor Mass, you can't really do in a liturgy. Um, and that there's nothing wrong with them as, as music and, and as expressions of piety and so on. I have no problem. But we're at a remove from the liturgy at that point already, and that's uh, with Monteverdi, that's pretty early on. Um, you know, a generation after Palestrina, basically. Um, so, so I think you see a, a, a beginning of a kind of um, both an expansion in forms, but also a little bit of fragmentation that's a little problematic. But we don't see it yet because, um, no, there's just a lot of great music at that point. So, um, but I, I would think actually the musicologist might be able to answer that with, with more authority than I can. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to weigh in on it. Does that address your question, though? Or? Palestrina even started uh, kind of a folk sacred tradition, didn't it? Well, he, he uh, I, as I understand it, he wrote some uh, secular music as a young man and then really regretted it later on. Um, but, you know, Josquin wrote lots of uh, uh, songs, uh, popular songs. They were are really wonderful. Um, Lasso wrote plenty of secular music. Um, that, that was not uncommon. But they weren't, they weren't done in church, and th there was a clear, there, was, there were clear requirements. So, again, with Josquin's music for uh, popular use is a very different kind of sound. And he, he even makes a distinction between more uh, devotional type motets and then music that's for the mass, which tends to be in a more antique style. Uh, so it, it connects more to chant and so on. So Monteverdi wouldn't work in liturgy because it's really too complex? It, it, yeah. it's, it takes a really long time and you have to have a whole orchestra and, and yeah, yeah. I, mean, I suppose it could be done, but you couldn't do it every week. You know, I, we, I, we have to sing Vespers every night. <laughs> so. I mentioned we actually do most of our office in English and uh, it's not it's not a translation as much as it is and uh, using approved translations and then modeling the the actual sequence of notes I guess the melody after the exemplars that are in the antiphonale um, I, I'm biased I think I think it works pretty well in our monastery uh, I think I learned a lot from studying other attempts that were done earlier and, and some of the problems that I felt. I also uh, was very much helped by lots of advances in, in what's called semiology, which is the study of the earliest notation of chant, 
which is almost entirely rhythmic and not melodic. Uh, not, it doesn't give pitch, it just gives rhythm. And um, it seems to suggest that you know, these chants were being done in smaller types of churches where lots of rhythmic nuance could be uh, used. It wouldn't get lost in a huge Gothic church. Uh, there's a lot of rhetorical emphasis uh, in terms of getting the text out and, and interpreting the text. And all of this, I think, you know, should work in any language uh, because any language is going to have its own rhetorical strategies, you know. And, and uh, um, though, uh, yeah, there, some things have to be adapted. Certain, say, uh, psalmody, so, uh, psalm tones, I felt it helpful to change a few of the notes because otherwise um, it sounds syncopated or something like that in English where we're used to very strong accents, whereas Latin doesn't have that. So that, that's just a very brief answer to a really huge question. <laughs> Let me just give a call out to my colleague, Dean Robertson. Um, some of whose most recent work, we, so for a long time there's a mass uh, based by Guillaume Dufay, an early 15th century composer, which is based on a seemingly secular song called C'est la face a pale. If the lover has a pale face, it is because of love. And it's precisely Dean Robertson's work that has related the seemingly secular tune, which is the basis for Dufay's mass, not to lovers languishing for love or whatever the case might be, but to the veneration of the so-called Shroud of Turin, um, which was in the, um, in the possession and still today is in Torino in, in Northwest Italy. Um, uh, and the, the, the face of the lover that is pale for love is simply the face of Christ on the shroud. Um, so again, in line also with what uh, Father Peter said and, uh, and Margot and stuff like that, I think that we have to be careful not to impose um, anachronistic meanings on what these bases uh, uh, might have been, uh, because you, this is say the Lafasai Pale, as Anne's work has shown, is not the only case where you can really under, if you understand these texts allegorically, as late medieval men and women would have done so, uh, there really are important devotional meanings, um, and it's not sort of like we're just singing the Kyrie here and you know thinking of sort of our secular loves. I was just going to say, my, I, I believe there's a lot of work being done in this area, because, and it's, it's, um, I, I don't know how to interpret those myself, so I would have to rely on someone else's expertise. Uh, uh. All you have to do really is think about the City of God by Augustine, and uh, there you see how uh, in the earth that we live, we, we don't live in the City of God. Um, we, can, we can yearn toward it, but we don't live in it. And so we, we live in an in a earth where things are mixed up and where um, one thing can be a reflection of another and a reflection of another and a reflection of another. And the ironies that come from it and also the spiritual longing and learning are a result of these things, I think. So, I mean, medieval motets are filled with uh, two different stories on two different planes, the shepherdess in the field and the Virgin Mary in, in heaven. And so it's a very uh, important aspect of, uh, of Christian understanding to mix these things. With that, we'll continue our conversations afterwards. Thank you so much for coming to this panel. Let's thank our speakers. <laughs>